we have a fabulous panel and the good news of having a great panel is I have to speak very little, so I'm very happy about it. And I'll let all the panelists talk about it. So just a quick introduction, Arpit uh, from Bloom Ventures, and they do a lot of very early stage and also um, series uh, C and C pre-series uh, investments. And, and Bloom is one of the pioneers in that in that segment and that and what, how many do you have now, 100 plus? Uh, 140 companies. So, you know, so if, if you're, uh, IOT deep tech uh, as well. So he's a great guy for all investment related question. Shom, he's, uh, I, I keep uh, telling him there are Triambarate, you know, Shom, Arvind Tiwari and uh, Venki who are kind of the IOT leaders of India. So, you know, and he was the first one to correct me saying, what the hell are you saying? 800, it's 1500 startups. So I stand corrected. Sorry about that mistake, Shom. And Swapna from Qualcomm Ventures and they look at different kinds of uh, uh, startups, but um, more importantly, very technology oriented startup as well. And finally, Isha from Entrepreneur First uh, Organization, they're also pre-seed uh, investment. So, you know, we have investors from across different stages. So Qualcomm is looking at Series B. Uh, they, uh, they are doing uh, pre-seed and Bloom is doing uh, seed and pre-series A and, and Zoom is all Series A. So I think, you know, irrespective of which phase you are in, there is someone to answer your question. So, so that's a quick introduction to the panelists, but I'll start. Uh, with Som on this, the, the topic says hype and reality. So, I would I would like Som to talk about little bit about the landscape of where IoT is in a, in, in a couple of minutes, and then say, you know, because we all have been hearing about IoT IoT for quite some time, but really haven't seen any startup take off. You know, in the sense like, when is the hype actually going to convert to reality? And there is a is there a timeline or is it a technological issue? Is, there, is it is it a customer adoption issue? So, so sure, show on sure, to you to sure. give a quick perspective on yeah. on this so, landscape. So I think the the most important piece is you can't take IoT as a single category. You have to look at different market verticals. So if I look at the different market verticals, the one that kind of moved the probably the fastest was obviously the smartwatches wearable category. The last time I checked. 2018 numbers were 172 million, going up to 222 million, right? Out of that, smartwatches would probably be in the 60 to 80 mil kind of range. If you look at then smart homes, I'm going to quickly kind of give you a view of the volumes or so forth you get in each one of these categories. If you then look at smart homes, overall, um, smart home as a category hasn't really evolved that much. But if you look at specific subcategories, smart thermostat, around between 15 to 20 million devices getting sold annually. Video doorbells getting three to four million video doorbells getting sold annually, right? Then you come to automotive, connected cars, actually a reality today. So close to 20 to 25 million out of the 80 to 90 million automotive sold globally are connected cars, and I am not even including um, uh, aftermarket sales, right, after that. So these are probably the three, four categories, and then logistics, transportation has happened as well. So these are the areas that IoT really scaled up. Where things are really lagging are the remaining ones. Industrial has been, a, uh, it has been an extremely slow, fragmented market. And frankly speaking, uh, especially in the factory side, the smart factories and so forth, these machines are getting utilized for 10, 15, 20 years. So, and it's so fragmented that aftermarket has become more of a systems integration play rather than a scale up play, right? Then you look at healthcare because of all the audacities of FDA approvals and so forth. It has been a challenge. I mean, there's zillions of companies, good companies, but scale up is just way too slow, right? On the healthcare domain. Smart cities, frankly speaking, other than surveillance, and thanks to China for that, China and a couple of cities like London and so forth, uh, you know, it's still kind of a bit of a dream for smart cities. Uh, patches, lots of pilots, but not really a scale-up story, right? So, uh, you know, and what else did I miss? Any specific categories I missed? Agree, agree. Agree. Agree, I think, again, mostly in developed nations, Australia, US, large farms, 100 acres farms. That's where I think uh, John Deere and so forth has really made a big push. Again, volumes, I'm, I'm not, Stellaps has done good, good, but again, from an India perspective, because of the unit economics, because of the one acre farm, one and a half acre farm, it has been a bit of a struggle. So yeah, if you look at the entire landscape, few things really moved fast, it has happened. 
few other pieces. I mean, think about it like IT. We talk about IT. It took 20 years. And IT evolved. So IoT is, is going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a, you know, sudden hockey stick takeoff. So, 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 um, so what's, what's the takeaway? So how many of you, I forgot to ask this question, how many of you are in IoT space doing, looking, doing startups now? Um, what stage is it? In three stages, I'll put early stage, mid stage, growth stage. Early stage, how many? Okay, mid stage, growth stage is none. none. So that tells the reason why you're having this discussion on high versus reality. So we need to figure out how to move all the guys in the mid stage to the next stage. So, so coming to you, Isha, like we talked about three or four different verticals, right? Since you are a very early stage uh, investor, what are you seeing in the market today? What kind of entrepreneurs are coming to you? What kind of companies you're you willing to take a bet on? Like to Shom's point, smart homes, smart cities haven't taken off. Industrial IoT, we t spoke about it quite a bit. And when you get into smart watches and other things, the competition is very high, right? Goki is there. And then Fitbit just got acquired by Google. So you know, putting money, anything against Google will become a no-no now. So, so what spaces do you think are attractive from an investment perspective that entrepreneurs should pursue? I mean, not to say that the entrepreneurs should pursue only those things that are being funded, but you know, what are investors looking for? Um, I can talk a bit about the trends we are seeing, okay. uh, as opposed to being prescriptive. <laughs> so I think, um, at Entrepreneur First, I think we are actually, even before startups, so we look at aspiring founders and help them find co-founders and build companies. And a lot of what we're seeing is, um, is new areas. So we're seeing a lot of healthcare. We're seeing IoT applications in retail, which is one we didn't speak about. Um, Agri, of course, I think broadly is something uh, that's seeing a lot of solutions around deep tech. Um, but I completely agree with Soam's assessment that just the unit economics make it a very, very tough sector. I think in healthcare specifically is very interesting for us because the way I like to say it, that's where the most is broken in India. And that's where the most needs fixing. It's also tough because of the regulatory challenges, but I think it started. So with Niramai, with Sigtapul, I think it started where people are now shaping the ecosystem and shaping the support system to make it work. Um, the, the very interesting space, in addition to healthcare, is retail from our perspective. Because again, I think um, the move from brick and mortar to e-commerce to now omni-channel now allows and lends itself really well to a lot of IoT applications, uh, which is why, again, we're seeing, um, and there's much more capacity to pay in the customers, so the adoption gets much easier as well. Um, I mean, that said, of course, there's a lot of funding challenges, but that's for another question. Any, any couple of uh, deals that you have seen recently that comes to mind that stands out saying, absolutely, got to fund this? That you can think of? So we did fund one. can talk about that. Um, it's a company called QSense. Um, so very interesting. So basically, these are handheld olfaction devices mm. that actually sniff out if the food is going to get bad. And this is based on one of the co-founder's research of five years. Um, but basically, is able to tell three days in advance um, when the perishables are getting spoiled. Mm. So now imagine, um, the way the founders like to talk about it, like imagine if Ola had no idea where the cars were and were trying to send you a cab, right? So if you are like a warehouse, if you are you know, um, uh, a Zomato or a Big Basket, if you don't know when your stuff is going bad, how do you manage inventory and how you prioritize? Mm. And so suddenly if you have a network of devices that can actually sniff out and tell you which ones to sell first, which ones to sell on a premium, all of those things, it becomes very interesting. And so that's the fact that these kinds of solutions were not viable three years ago because the big baskets of the world did not exist, mm. you know, three to five years ago. So I think that's why now this third wave of IoT startups is becoming very interesting. Okay. So, so moving, coming to you, Swapna, in terms of technology, like, uh, you know, industrial IoT, is it, is it been a technology issue that the connectivity is an issue, the wiring is an issue, or, or why, is, why is the adoption slow? Uh, what, what is stopping the adoption from really accelerating? You know, and how much technology impediments are we seeing in the actual deployment of IoT, right? Because that, that becomes very important. Operational aspects and deployment aspects become very important. Are you seeing that as a kind of, a, you know, styming the forward progress? On, and if so, what, what technologies you think are coming down the road that will fix it? I think I'll start with a more of an anecdotal thing here, right? Uh, I don't think IoT is new. Uh, I, the volumes are new. 
So in my mind, I always use this, uh, that first IoT was really an ATM machine, where machines could talk and tell you that, hey, money needs to be put in here, it's over. It could take five years to five hours to get that done, but there was a message which was being sent by those machines. Today, now we are in a world where we're not talking about 50 devices connected, 500, but billion plus devices. Now, when you have to talk about 500, a billion plus devices, you can't talk about LAN. Uh, you can't have a 3G or 4G help those issues because the speed is a challenge. Bandwidth is a challenge, and if you need machines to talk real time to each other, the speeds have to be phenomenal. So last week in China, for example, three large telcos announced 5G. So 5G is a reality, right? Uh, Qualcomm Ventures, three weeks back, we announced a $200 million 5G fund. And we believe that the biggest wave which is going to be conquered with this 5G deployment is IoT because, we, well, we gave smartphone to the world, but we want to make everything smart which means every device should be connected, and the only way it can be connected is by the sensors which go in there and which can actually... So you put sensors everywhere, but if they can't talk to each other, it's a challenge. Which means if 5G is a technology out there, we believe IoT will be a reality. In India, may not today, maybe two years later, but you'll soon start seeing devices talk to each other. So our belief is IoT is here. Uh, it's slower adoption, but Internally, we like to say, for example, we are very, very sector agnostic. We say dairy to defense. So we have done IoT deals in dairy sector. We have done IoT deals in defense sector. They may not be as scaled today because it takes time to adopt some of these technologies. But five years later, I see a very, very bright future. And in terms of the startups you are supporting as well, how applicable you think that the solutions that we're building for the Indian market can scale to the outside world, you know, in terms of standards, in terms of deployment, you know, is, is, do you see that as a challenge? Because for the startups that are coming here, specifically if it's hardware oriented and other things, you know, is it easy to get the validation in India and then move out or that you think is a challenge? Uh, I think it depends on the sector you're attacking. So for example, we have invested in this company called, for example, we have invested in this company called Stel Stellabs, which Arpit was mentioning, right? It's a dairy IoT company. Uh -huh. Now it is meant <laughs> for small farms. If you try and go to US with that product, it will not work because US essentially has large farm holdings. Mm -hmm. But if you go to something like a Europe, a Switzerland, a Denmark, where small farm size holdings are there, oh. it's going to work like a miracle because you can actually put those sensors out there. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on the market you're catering mm -hmm. to. I don't think we should shy away that we are only India-focused technology companies. We are increasingly seeing our companies. For example, we have a company in defense called Tonbo Imaging. Mm. They have computer vision cameras, which is helping border defense forces to do surveillance. They're actually selling to Philippines, Lithuania armies. I mean, think of a product by built, built out of India for international markets. It's phenomenal. Uh, okay. So, Arpit, coming to you, like um, 140 investments, out of which how much, even if you stretch the definition of IoT, how much of those category uh, come under the category of IoT? And as a fund, what what is your take on how you're seeing them grow and, and, and what do you think is stopping them from really accelerating, getting the hockey stick uh, growth? So uh, out of about 140 investment that we have done, I think with some stretch, in, including gray orange if yeah, I can, okay. <laughs> about seven, eight investments in uh, IoT broadly, uh, some some hardware, some software, you know, such as Tricog, Zenitex and so on. So see, IoT or not IoT, we are, a, we are a sector agnostic kind of technology kind of fund where anything will work for us as long as it is tech enabled, which means that, uh, this, and, and from our perspective, the, the, they face the same challenges that any other business would face. So having a product market fit would be the same challenge. Uh, uh, delivering the same service to a customer for the same cost, for lower cost enough, is the same challenge. Uh, that you will have to find a way to fund the devices so that you can uh, hit the market and reach scale is the same challenge. So the challenges remain the same. Of course, it becomes harder because uh, you have to make the stuff work in the real world. Like Zenetics, one uh, example, they spent 45 days figuring out that there was electromagnetic interference happening at the customer premises in the place where the device was kept. And you can't recreate that situation in the lab, which is just hard, right? So you have to make that more and more robust, which is harder. Apart from that, the challenges are the same. Uh, however, the beauty is, like things like Stellabs, when they work, they catch like, like hot fire, uh, wildfire, because it's just so well, right? It just fits very well, beautifully, and scales up uh, rightly. Uh, so yeah, it's, if it works, it works very well. It is just hard to make it work, is the experience. Like Tricog today is such so fabulous, right? It's just so easy to explain to anyone uh, in these countries. It just works. And then, and then so in this in case of Tricog, are you also seeing expansion outside of India right now, or is it still India-focused at this point? 
everywhere. So they have 10 countries where they have deployments okay. and paid deployments, mm. which is very cool. Mm. So, in, so hence, if you go through the agri tech, health tech, industrial IoT, so what? Where is your bet currently? Health tech? Because so, Tycog so is... Uh, very uh, interestingly, the company that I, uh, I hate to miss was a company in consumer IoT. Yeah. This company is called Emotix. Yeah. It had got funded last year by IDG and uh, Yonest, mm. right? And uh, I spoke to that company. I spoke to that guy and I was very impressed. But since I had a phone call and then, then didn't follow up, I just felt it was too hard. The guy is doing extremely well mm. and selling abroad. Just I just love it. I can imagine imagine a twenty two thousand rupees device mm. for consumers mm. being sold for more than two crore rupees a month is fabulous, right? I mean, if that is not uh, uh, success of Indian hardware product, product design, software, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's amazing, right? Mm. And, and then there are companies in drones. There's a company which I really like a lot called Red Wing. You must have heard about Red Wing, yeah, it's doing very well. Mm. Uh, I've, uh, there's a couple of companies in retail analytics, they're saying, okay, we will do all the, because the cost of devices have suddenly come down, you can actually build a network without anyone funding it, right? And you can say, say for example, put 25 or 30 different sensors, maybe 100 different sensors in a mall, and then say, okay, I have a deployment in 100 malls, and then brands start, start talking to you, mm. which is really cool, right? This, this couldn't happen three years back even. Right? And I think that's, uh, I'm just slipping the name of the company, which has built a network already and now talking to the brands. Mm. Right? So the core proposition that it has to work, it has to work for you, it has to work for the customer, and once it works for both of you, mm. then there is no stopping. Okay. And in terms of the hardware, so I, I know you've been part of IESA and a lot of other, other organizations and been pushing this hardware um, quite a bit. Where do you think we stand with respect to the hardware development, the, the, the ability to uh, build stuff in India? Is the thing See, it's, it's tough. I mean, there's no <laughs> denial to that, right? It takes, I mean, whatever amount of time you guys would uh, put for software, at least double or 3x the time that would take for hardware. And I mean, I'll just give you an example. We funded a company in the IoT space uh, called Detect Technologies. Yeah. And that is uh, essentially figuring out the uh, corrosion and leakage in oil pipes, refineries, and so forth. So it's a magnetoresistive sensor material clamping onto a pipe, and then it sends out a bunch of ultrasonic waves and so forth. So, I mean, frankly speaking, and again, coming back to your question about India versus global, so these guys, as they, in India, frankly speaking, they were able to get a bunch of pilots and customers, paying customers and so forth pretty easily. Now they're pretty much in Houston, right? Yeah. Talking with the big boys. Yeah. And that's where kind of the, you know, certification. So they have two product lines. On one product line, we suddenly figured out, hey, you need FAA approval for it, right? <laughs> Aviation approval to fly drones in the uh, oil refinery area, yeah. right? So a couple of these surprises also come up. But overall, I think, see, the hardware piece is doable. A lot of companies have shown that it's, it's, it's possible. But as an investor, we obviously need to see, you know, it's 3x the time, the amount of time, energy, iterations they take. For example, this company is unable to find a certification body in India. And the US is way so expensive. And out here, people are asking for bribes as well. So those things happen. It still, it still goes on. <coughs> So fundamentally, we believe that uh, most technology which is being used in the US was developed 20 years back. And most technology is being de developed in India is happening, happening today. The, the, because we are working on a far advanced technology, and once the product works, it will have global application. Like, why wouldn't you use a Tricog service in the US? Like, there's no reason why you won't, right? And similarly everywhere. So I think there's, there's a, a, there's a opportunity for our startups to not just solve problems in India, but actually solve the problem for the world, because what we work in Indian condition, of course, is far better than and robust than anything else. So, so before we open up, just one quick, quick round. You know, each of you, um, one interesting IoT startup you have seen in the past three months that you really liked? Quickly. Already answered that one. No, outside of that now. <laughs> so since you answered that, I'm, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot and say one more. <laughs> Um, you're going to say it's a cop-out, but I, I really admire Goki and what they've done. Mm. Um, I think 
to be able to get to that scale, to be able to get to that credibility, I think is huge. Um, and it also kind of opens up the stage for what's possible. We keep talking about it's slow and all of that, but I think um, if it works, if you're able to make it work in the real world and you find the right product market fit, I think the sky's the limit and there's no reason why people looking at IIT startups should be thinking small. Of course. Okay. So now yours. Um, so I recently met a very interesting startup in manufacturing setup. Um, so manufacturing is where we feel the most impact of IoT will be felt because there's so many devices. Am I echoing? No. Okay. So uh, manufacturing setup is where we believe the impact will be maximum because there's so many devices which need to be connected out there. So I met this company which said, look, everybody's trying to do predictive maintenance by looking at past data of machines, how they're operating, what are their patterns, when the breakdown happened, when was the last maintained. But this company said, look, machines also have a heart. Can I listen to its heart? And they actually started listening to the vibrations the machine was making. And when they started listening to the vibration, they could actually exactly predict when the machine will break down. So those are the insights which people generate and actually are able to listen to machines and talk to them back. And that is a world I think we all envisage where everybody can speak to machines. That's why I really love that company. Nice. So detect won't count? No, no. Okay. Whatever you've spoken about, it won't come. Okay. You have to so, uh, the pretty interesting company I've been involved with as an advisor, a company called Machine Sense. So again, as uh, uh, Swapna mentioned, uh, so these guys, they essentially figured out this AI ML stuff that's going on. Unfortunately, just hearing through the vibrations or the noise patterns and so forth, right? It's the sound patterns. It's extremely difficult because different machines, different brands, different models, they've been commissioned maybe 10, 15 years back, right? They're still running and they have been maintained differently. So the amount of variabilities in those conditions is just way too much. So these guys essentially built up the basic models of motors, pumps, and so forth, grounds up from basic electrical models, right? And they're using the AIML piece, whatever data they're gathering, just to fine tune the model. Uh, there's so many. I'll just take what is top of my mind. Yeah. So Alpha ACs was top of my mind. Uh, they are building some fabulous technology. Their numbers that I looked at, I'm not a great tech guy to really evaluate, so uh, maybe you have a different opinion, but I thought that what they are doing is definitely top class, world class. It can't be better than that anywhere in the world. And we are proving that you know our technology can go into hundreds and thousands of devices, and, and they will be a very big company coming out of India. So I'm very excited about that, although we are not in it. No, no, that, that's good. I'm, you're bringing up companies that you're not in your portfolio. That's fantastic. So we have what five? How many minutes do we have for questions? One minute. One minute. Okay, so I can get two questions, thirty seconds each, uh, or we can take the questions off. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Want to know the what is what are the questions? Sorry, we are we are talking at the back, so we didn't hear the question. <laughs> so my question is very simple. Uh, like uh, we, when, whenever we talk to, because I'm coming from California, huh. uh, so whenever I talk in California, when you talk about Indian ecosystem and uh, U.S. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. All the Indians say that Indian ecosystem is amazing, awesome, all the great minds come in, we have the IPs and all those. But when I come to India, it's exactly opposite. Mm. We, the Indian ecosystem is, is superb, but it's completely different than the other, uh, parts of the, uh, other parts of the world. Why we are so much uh, resistant in doing the early seedings, I know you guys are doing it, but this is what, from my experience from the last three years, I'm what I'm seeing. Because mm. okay. there, there are friends who are in India. So the question is, are we, are we ready for early stage funding? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so, but you, you need to look at the amount of risk capital in each country as well, right? So while close to early stage investing, if I'm not mistaken, in US is for 30 to $40 billion every year, right? So our series C, series A, series B, series C funding is probably one, 1.4 billion, right? So you need to kind of look at from that perspective. Number two essentially is, if you look historically, we are probably just getting into this third wave of the startup evolution in India. First wave was all services. The second wave, the entire investment thesis was on the India's consumer story. It's only now that after 20 years of evolution of these R&D centers in India, people returning back like you from the valley and so forth, we are onto the third stage, which is more deep tech, 
core tech kind of space. And that's relatively new, right? So if you start looking at it, the quantum of that, even the $1.4 billion, I think close to 1.1 billion would probably be in the B2C space. So this ecosystem is still relatively new. The first fund was set up in 1999. So it's been just 20 years versus 50, 60, 70 years in the valley. So we are morphing, but we are morphing quick, right? So if you see the panel out here, we are pretty much all deep tech core tech folks from pre-pre-series A to seed to pre-series A, series A and series B. All right, so I've been cautioned to stop now, so we are running out of time. Do you have anything quick to add? Yeah, should, yeah. yeah. That might uplift you. Uh, in the last three years, the amount of funding that's gone into deep tech has doubled in India. This is a, from a very small number. But from a very small number, I think it's still probably one tenth or something of the US number. But I think we're at an inflection point. It's kind of the inflection point we saw eight years ago when there was a lot of the consumer tech that Soam spoke about. Um, so hang in there. There's a lot of people focusing on early stage deep tech. Cool. Thanks a lot, and thanks thanks for the panelists for. Uh, cooperating on this and then giving out companies that are not in your portfolio. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs>